All right, it looks like the folks signing up have slowed down to a trickle, so I think we can probably get started. Um, uh, so firstly, this is this is our uh, community mitigation fund workshop for uh, municipalities. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we uh, delve in. Uh, first, this is being recorded. Um, we are doing that so that we can we can put this up on the website uh, afterwards if people want to um, listen in to what we had to say if they weren't able to make the meetings and so on. Um, and so my name is Joe Delaney. I'm the uh, Chief of Community Affairs here for the Mass Gaming Commission, and I'm joined by Mary Thurlow, who's our uh, Senior our Program Manager, and Lily Wallace, our Program Manager. Um, and pretty much uh, for the, you, the folks who have dealt with the Community Mitigation Fund before, the, the three of us are the people that you uh, deal with mostly because uh, we're, we're pretty much the whole show here. So, <clears throat> um, so with that, um, uh, so during the process of this, we will stop a couple of times for questions and answers. Um, uh, we would ask that if you had any questions while we're presenting, if you could use the chat function. So you see that at the, um, uh, you know, on your, um, uh, say you can use the chat function uh, to type in any questions and we'll keep, we'll monitor those and as, as we're going along and certainly answer them during, uh, during the breaks. Um, we also do ask if you can stay muted uh, during the presentations. Uh, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, when we do get to questions and answers, uh, I do see a couple of folks, I think, uh, who checked in on the phone, um, although I'm not seeing anybody now. Um, if, you do, if you do call in uh, on the phone, star six would be what you need to do to unmute. Um, and also we will be uh, loading the PowerPoint that we're gonna share with you up on our website so that you can uh, take a look at that afterwards uh, if you need a, a bit of a refresher. So with that, I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen. We've got a, a PowerPoint presentation to go through um, and we will, um, let's see. Okay, is everybody seeing that? Okay, so again, this is our Community Mitigation Fund, our municipal grant workshop. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go over um, sort of what's new with the program, which is a lot. Um, we, we really revamped this whole program for the year. Um, and then what we will do after we go through some of the the highlights of the changes, we will then walk through a, a grant application with all of you. Um, what we have done is we put together an example application. We create, created our fictional town of Sudburham, and uh, we will walk you through parts of that. We have also uploaded this whole uh, example on our website, and later on in the presentation, we'll also walk you through our website a little bit so that you can uh, help you find the things, that, the uh, resources that you need to find on the uh, website. Okay, so let's jump right in. What is new for the 2025 grant round? Um, the first thing is um, we have created a two-tiered uh, grant program. The first part is the municipal block grant, which is what we're here to discuss today. And then the second item is the regional agency grant. So that is for uh, like the district attorney's offices and um, regional planning agencies and our workforce uh, programs. Uh, we will not be discussing that here today. We have a separate uh, workshop set up uh, for next week for those regional agencies. But so, so today we'll be focusing on that the block grant uh, program itself. <clears throat> so on the block grant program, um, all of the communities have received um, a, a grant, a, a proposed grant amount for their communities that identify how much money that uh, can be applied for. Um, so, so you have all of that. Um, so on the regional, on the municipal block grants, excuse me, um, the municipalities are required to submit a single application for the entire community. For those of you who have, who have come in for grants before with us, um, Oftentimes, uh, different uh, departments would submit their own grant applications. For instance, a community might 
have an application from a police department, from a fire department, and also from a planning agency. Uh, and um, for this year, or going forward, I should say, we will be requiring a single application for the entire community. So what that means is that, um, you know, the community is going to have to get together. All of the various departments um, who, who are looking for grant funds are going to have to get together and decide how to divvy up the amount of money that has been uh, designated for your community. Um, so, so once you do that, applications will be filled out on the various categories and then submitted to us as a single grant application. Um, you'll hear this from us um, a few times today just because it's, it's very important. These applications are due to us by January 31st. If we don't receive an application from your community, the grant funds uh, for your community will be forfeited for that year. That doesn't mean you can't come in, uh, in years after that. But, but um, we have a statutory requirement in, in the Expanded Gaming Act that says all applications have to be into us before February 1st, which in this case obviously is January 31st. So please keep that in mind when putting together any of your uh, applications. The third item is we have uh, tried as uh, best we can to provide some more detailed project guidance for the communities. Um, we heard this in, in a lot of the outreach meetings that we did is that anything that we can do to better define what the impacts are and what some of the types of projects people can do uh, would be appreciated by the communities. And we have tried to do that as, as much as we can. So um, in the guidelines, in the, in the 2025 guidelines, um, what we've done in each grant category is we've said, here are what the impacts are that we recognize. Here are some of the types of projects that you could do that would uh, address those impacts. And also we've provided some uh, ineligible projects. Um, we have had in the past um, communities come in and asking for things that really weren't eligible. They were either um, sort of routine municipal expenses or other things. And we've tried to pull those out. And, and so we would certainly ask uh, all of the communities uh, to, to read those 2025 guidelines. I believe when we sent out this meeting invitation, we attached um, a PDF copy of the guidelines to each and every person who, um, who was invited to this meeting. So you should all have those guidelines and, and, we, and we really hope that you uh, take a good look through them because they have changed uh, quite a lot from, from previous years. Uh, the next item is uh, administrative costs. Previously, we did not allow any of the grant funds to be used uh, for uh, the cost of administering the grant. We will now allow up to 7.5% of the grant to be used for administration uh, with a cap of $50,000. So what that does is for those folks who are pulling together the quarterly reports or the uh, payment requests or any of the other things that are, are associated with the administration of the grant, um, some of those uh, that time can be charged off against the grant itself. So hopefully that will um, ease the burden on the communities a, a little bit. Um, the next item, uh, funding for regional planning agencies. Uh, we're not going to talk about this extensively today uh, because this, these are falls under the regional um, uh, application. Um, so we are uh, providing $250,000 to each of the regional planning agencies that are associated with the gaming establishments. So those are uh, MAPC, PVPC, and uh, SERPED. Um, but so if a community or communities have, have something that they consider to be a more regional impact that they want addressed, it might make sense to, to contact your regional planning agency to talk about that with them to see if there is some opportunity um, to either use those grant funds for those regional type projects. Um, and then the next item was we are converting this to a fiscal year. You'll see on all of our documents now, it's the FY 2025. Uh, CMF grant. So technically there will be no 2024 grant. Uh, we did this. Um, the commission itself operates on the state fiscal year and 
I think all of our communities operate on that same state fiscal year that starts uh, July 1st. So we just wanted to come into uh, alignment with that. Um, and then item seven on waivers. Uh, we've always had a waiver process for any of our, our guidelines. And we will talk about this at, at, at some more length uh, later in this presentation. Um, but when we developed this block grant program, our fear was that, that we could run into a, a case or two or three um, where a community may have projects that exceed the allotment that they were uh, that they were given. And what we did in order to address that, um, at least initially in this first year of the, this block grant program, is to um, allow a community to request a waiver from that amount um, if they have, you know, sort of a specific project that might kick them over on. On that amount. So um, we will talk about this more later and also this item number eight, um, the transportation uh, category. We've, we've done some changes there. We've combined the transportation planning and the transportation construction uh, categories into a single uh, transportation category. Um, we have also have put some limitations on um, on the planning projects themselves, on what, what's eligible for, for, for projects, not just for planning, but for tra transportation projects. And also we've changed the method of calculating the subsidy for transportation construction projects. Um, so we will go through those in more detail um, later in this presentation. Now, what hasn't changed? Um, the basic tenet of this program is that Every single project has to identify a casino related impact. And every project has to be designed to mitigate that identified impact. Those things have always been true in the program and, and do not change now. What we are trying to do here is, is to, to make it um, a little easier for communities to, to identify those casino related impacts and, and also provide some guidance on uh, what types of projects might be eligible uh, to address those impacts. So um, that has always been the case and will be the case um, as, the, as long as the law exists as it does, um, which requires us to, to mitigate those casino related impacts. So how do you determine a casino related impact? Now, what we did this past year is, um, you know, we heard loud and clear from our advisory committees and from uh, some outreach uh, that we had with communities that helping the communities identify the casino related impacts would be, uh, would be a great help. So what we did was we looked at all of our research that we've done over the years. We've looked at, we um, have a consultant that we've worked with this company, Grio, um, who has uh, done a lot of work in the problem gambling arena, but we also asked them to look at other jurisdictions and other studies that might have been done to see if we could identify um, casino related impacts. So again, we looked at our own research and we also looked at uh, other things on, on, on just looking out, uh, doing research um, out on the internet where we found you know, guidance documents by um, you know, like the American uh, uh, Gaming Association and others that, that talked about some specific impacts and how to try to prevent them. So we tried to uh, compile all of that and, and include as much of it as we could into our guidelines. So again, it's very important that you look at the guidelines um, and that will outline sort of those things that we recognize as being impacts or you know, likely impacts of the casino. What, what we did learn in our research is that there's, there's a lot of hedging of, of some of these things where, where the, where the uh, studies say, well, it may be associated, it could be associated with the casino. And we, we tried to take those things that, that we considered to be likely uh, to be associated with the casino as, as being the casino impacts. Now, with that said, um, if a community out there has uh, something else that, um, is not included in our guidelines or in some of these other, other research, they've done research on their own or whatever the case may be, uh, community can certainly submit that along with their application. Um, and we will, we will certainly consider it, but the bar obviously is higher on something like that um, than it is uh, picking something right out of our guidelines. 
Um, okay, and then the, the, the last item I wanted to talk with before we get to some questions and answers. Um, when we crafted this program, we have obviously we have several categories that um, grants can be done in. And uh, the commission really would like to see the money spread across these various categories. Um, and initially, when we looked at this, we thought about, you know, similar to the Community Preservation Act, where they have, I think, three categories of grants that say a certain amount of money has to be spent in each grant category. Um, we thought about doing that, but uh, in the end, we decided to not make that a requirement at least for uh, fiscal year 2025. Um, we did put in sort of a suggested minimum spending for each category, saying 15% for community planning, transportation, public safety, and the gambling harm reduction. Um, and that would leave 40% that could be spread among those or in the specific impact category as appropriate. Um, now we do understand that some communities um, that are getting the minimum uh, grant amounts um, it may not make sense to try to split those those amounts up into uh, into multiple categories, um, and, and and we get that. Um, but we would like to see um, the issues that are addressed in 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 all of the categories. So for the, at least this first year, we're going to just monitor this, and we will, um, um, you know, we'll, we'll monitor how the communities do, and we'll look at it you know for, for next year to see if we want to make this a requirement or if we just want to keep it as as a, a suggestion um, and so I'm going to stop there with um, and I'm going to stop the sharing and, and open things up for uh, questions Joe there um, is there is a question from Bill Dignan of Cambridge. Does the first bullet on page five about projected impacts mean that funds may not be used for climate mitigation, such as flooding prevention related to the Mystic River? Well, I guess, again, the, the, uh, the answer to that is if, if, a, if a connection can be made to the casino, an impact from the casino as contributing to uh, flooding on the Mystic River, we, we could certainly consider it. But I, I would say that that, that, would, that would probably be a bit of a stretch trying to, trying to uh, equate uh, the casino with, with, with the flooding of the Mystic River. So okay. Joe, Joe, this is Bill. So, yes, Bill. So, the, so the fact that the casino produces emissions that contribute to climate change would not be considered. Um, well, you know, I mean, it, you would have to say, well, you know, what what percentage is the casino contributing to climate change based on everything else that happens in the community? I mean, again, it would it would probably be a a, a pretty uh, uh, it would be a bit of a stretch, I think, to try to to try to make that nexus, you know, to, to try to quantify how much uh, the casino is contributing. Are, are you requiring quantification for all other categories as well? No, what we're saying is if, if you if you use one of the uh, the um, impacts that are identified in our guidelines, you don't have to do any quantification. Okay. You know, so for instance, we said like in transportation, we're saying that, you know, the increases in traffic associated with the casino are likely to cause increases in congestion on the roadways. So if you do a project that decreases congestion on the roadways and, and it addresses it addresses congestion on you know sort of the, those major routes to the casino, um, th there's no quantification that you really need to do on that. It's if you're going off the board and not picking something out of the guidelines, that's where we we um, would require more um, justification. Okay, I respectfully ask the commission to reconsider that um, because I think climate related um projects are something that communities really want to do and i, th well, and I think you know the I, does contribute to that i mean I'm, I'm not i'm not um dismissing it out of hand but we would have to see what the application looked like to 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 you know to, to make that connection 
Okay, um, so let's see, we have a couple other questions. Uh, one from West Springfield, we have an equipment need at the police department. Does the FY 2025 mean we wouldn't be able to make the purchase until July of 2024? That is correct. Um, with, with these, we will, uh, you know, we'll be reviewing, uh, as we've done in the past, you know, we review our, all of these things come in January 31st, we review them through, uh, you know, uh, February, March, April, May, and, you know, we try to get all the awards out by, um, by uh, you know, the end of June. Um, so we have another question here. The MGC block grant requires all sub-projects submitted as one grant application. What if the MGC decides one portion of the grant is awardable, but not the others? Would the town forfeit the whole grant application, or could it be awarded a piece of the full budget? Yes, we we would uh, we would not reject the entire application. And and what would typically happen on this as we review these things? Um, you know, we look at this process as as being uh, far more collaborative. You know, in the past, we would look at the applications and then just send out a letter saying, "Hey, we have these questions," and ask you to respond. We think in, in this case, we would be able to, you know, we'll be able to work with the communities closer to saying, hey, maybe if you tweak this thing this way, we could get we could get that in under the grant. Um, obviously, we may run into a few things where we say, nope, there's just there's just no way. Um, but we would certainly award the remainder of the grant uh, to the community. Um, and then we say on regional application initiatives, should these ideas always go through the regional planning entities or can a, a couple of municipalities get together on their own? Um, yes, multiple communities can certainly work together. You can pool your money. Um, we do talk about that in our guidelines that, that it's absolutely eligible for communities to work together. I think just of the example of um, in the last couple of years, we had, you know, Foxborough, Plainville, and Rentham working together on on a sort of a regional initiative, and we we definitely don't want to discourage anyone from doing that. Um, the thought here was if there if there was something that was on that, that really needed to be dealt with on a more regional basis, that the regional planning agencies might be a, a better uh, way to go. Um, but definitely, we want uh, communities to think think about working together on on various initiatives. Um, let's see, it says here, Medford currently has a traffic engineer position through previous casino funding. As we move into FY 2025 and we improve our parking department, we need to hire a traffic enforcement officer. Would a position like this be eligible? So we talk in the guidelines about um, the hiring of staff. Um, the one thing is we, we, we won't pay for an entire position uh, through, through the community mitigation fund. Um, and anytime that, that someone is hiring staff, they have to demonstrate that, that you know, what time of theirs is being spent on casino related items. Um, that has proven to be a, a high bar to, to pass and I think still, still would be. Um, what we've done uh, in the past is uh, we've had communities certainly uh, do some you know, increased patrols and things like that that were that were done with overtime where they could really parse out, the, you know, that, hey, we're doing late night patrols because we're seeing an increase in DUIs uh, or whatever the case might be. And we think that's, you know, due to the casino. And we want to do some four hour blocks of late nights on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, in fact, that's something that we've done with Everett um, for the last couple of years. So, um, you know, hiring a traffic enforcement officer, uh, I think, community would be hard pressed to say that that officer is spending 100% of their time on casino related items, uh, which is something that would have to be certified to the commission. Um, so I think it's probably uh, either we could fund do partial funding of a position, but the community would have to come up with the remainder of the funding or um, something more like an overtime, um, overtime uh, position. Uh, you know, a type of work. Um, another question for clarification, can administrative funds cover staff time? Um, yes, I mean, that's that's what, that's uh, uh, largely what this is for. And again, this is for 
the, the people who are uh, you know, administering the grant, like I said, the people who are doing uh, quarterly reports and, and putting together payment estimates and, and doing all of those kinds of things that are of an administrative nature uh, you know, to, to, to administer the grant. Um, to say just you know, routine staff time, um, you know, uh, unless it's directly associated with the grant, um, you know, we, we wouldn't really be able to do that. Um, another question, uh, due to traffic related issues with the casino, are local police departments allowed to purchase a cruiser for traffic purposes? This would not be used for regular replacement of a vehicle. Um, you know, we have allowed purchases of, of, of vehicles, but these have to be something that supplement the operation and not supplant existing operations. So last year we had a lot of requests for vehicles and a lot of them when, when asked, well, what's, what's the status of this? It says, well, we're gonna buy these vehicles and replace two vehicles that we're gonna get rid of. And, and that is clearly um, supplanting existing funding. You know, communities have a responsibility to replace their vehicles and, and, and do that in a timely fashion. Um, and, and, and that's not something that's due to the casino at all. Um, you know, in in so it it has to be something that's sort of over and above what the community currently does, and it has to be related to the casino. So I, I mean, it's hard to answer the question directly by saying yes or no. Um, but in whatever proposal you're doing, you would need to demonstrate to us very clearly that this is not just a, a routine uh, municipal expenditure that they're trying to push off onto the community mitigation fund. Um, um, so let's see, uh, the next question we have, got a lot of questions here. This is, this is good. Um, our community received an allotment number. Is this the amount we can expect as long as we meet the grant guidelines or this more of a top amount we could possibly expect? Um, no, that is the amount that you can apply for. Um, you know, as long as you are following our guidelines and, and apply for projects, again, the two things that have to be done, you have to show a casino impact and you have to show how your project will mitigate that impact. If you do those two things, um, you know you will get you will get the grant. So it's it is our hope that all of the communities apply for the full amount of the grant and they all get awarded the full amount of the grant. That's what we would really love to see. Um, so the next question is: Can we combine into one project a traffic safety request from us? Plainville and Serphead. Um, in short, I would say yes. Uh, we would have to obviously see the details of it, but again, we allow different uh, groups to work uh, together. Um, you know, if 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 uh, so, this this was a request with, from North Attleboro talking about North Attleboro and Plainville and Serphead working together. Can, uh, you know, if North Attleboro and Plainville wanted to use SERPED to do some kind of uh, study for them, they could they could funnel money to SERPED to do that. Or if, uh, you know, so again, we encourage um, uh, projects that, 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 uh, that, you know, that go across multiple communities. You know, we love to see regionality whenever we can. Um, uh, question here about uh, whether any major changes to the public safety portion of the application. Uh, no, not particularly. Um, we did, uh, it was in the public safety area where we did have a, a lot of items uh, that came in that have come in um, that really aren't eligible for funding. So we did, uh, there are in the public safety area, there are a number of exclusions on um, on things that are not eligible for funding. Again, we talked about sort of routine replacement of equipment or vehicles or things like that. Um, you know, there are there are certain things that are the responsibility of a of a uh, police department or fire department. Uh, you know, EMTs to you know provide equipment to their employees and um, and um, you know, so so there's that. You know, we we um, we did put some of those exclusions in there. Um, question uh, on table 6.2-9. Uh, 
that, that I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that um, in, in, in this public meeting. I don't, I don't have the, it's a question from the city of Springfield. Um, Andy, we'll, we'll have to talk offline about that, um, uh, about the particular details on that. Um, okay, it seems that is all of the questions. Did anybody else have anything? Um, you, know, you can unmute to ask a question if you wanted to. Um, Joe, um, a quick question. Yes. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, got a question regarding the, it's a police issue in a, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Boston area police emergency radio network. So that's been in place uh, since the 1970s and it's a regional radio system used for emergency situations. And every community that's part of the, um, uh, that would be involved in the Encore area, as well as the Plainville area are all part of the Bayburn Regional Radio Network. Anyways, this system is in need of some upgrades. It's um, got some uh, equipment needs that are you know, near the end of life. Um, if we were to apply, I I'm assuming that would be under the regional uh, agency uh, grant part of it. That's what I wanna clarify. Uh, or would there be a, a different way to do that? So are you talking about Everett applying for well, it? It would, it would be, it would be uh, all these communities um, surrounding, not just Everett, it would be all the communities that are eligible in the Everett uh, region, as well as the Plainville region. It covers, this yep. radio network covers as everybody in those regions. Um, so it would be a, it would be a large group. And I know you mentioned like MAPC, that's what I'm just trying to understand how, how we could go about doing this. So, so yeah, you know, on the regional agency grants, you know, we spelled out some very, spe you know, specific agencies. Of course, we have DA's offices, we've got our workforce grants, and we have the regional planning grants. But other agencies can apply under that under that grant, um, you know. But again, they they've got to make that nexus to the casino. You know, we we yep. had a situation where down down in the Plainville area, one of the regional, um, I can't remember all of the details of it. Uh, one of the regional um, groups down there uh, uh, that, that does some like emergency response and stuff was looking for uh, radios for their operation. And we weren't able to really make any connection to the casino from that group. Um, yeah. You know, so that one might be, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say no to anything, but that one might be a tough sell because I remember, you know, Everett came in and needed some radios because you literally couldn't um, communicate from outside the casino into the inside of the casino. Yep. That certainly made sense. And we agreed that that was a casino related impact. But um, again, that's gonna be, that would be the challenge for something like that, I think is to make that that nexus. Yeah, I mean, this system is is used in emergency, like for example, there was a, an emergency at, at Encore or down at Plain, Plainville, um, when you have multiple agencies responding, that's what this radio network is designed for, for interoperable communications between multiple agencies. That's what it supports. Um, so any any large scale incident in and around there or uh, Plainville, I mean, I, I mean, I, I I think there's a nexus and connection. I mean, obviously, uh, and I appreciate you. You know, you're saying it wouldn't be automatically be no, but um, you know, maybe we'll just get some get some paperwork done up on it. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd start talking and see what, uh, you know, what comes out of it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so a couple more questions did come in. Uh, one is, can communities submit an application prior to the deadline and get a response prior to the deadline? You can certainly submit before the deadline, uh, but you will not get a response before the deadline. I mean, we can tell you that we received it, uh, but that's, that's about it. Uh, we don't open these things until after, uh, you know, on February 1 is the day that we sort of open the applications and start our review process. Um, and then would there be any flexibility to change use of the funds after award? Since needs may evolve, if the application specifies a particular project, but we find our needs change, will we be able to alter the use of funds later, perhaps by resubmitting a request to revise the application? Um, you know, short answer on that is yes. Um, you know, typically we've had uh, many grant applications that have come in where their scope has morphed a little bit and, um, um, you know, uh, and we've certainly made changes to them. You know, we would, 
we would like to keep those to a minimum if we can. Um, it's just a, it's just a lot of uh, review. Things have to go back to the commission for votes and so on. Um, but uh, but yeah, that certainly is something that can be done. And I see Aaron uh, Vega from Holyoke has his hand up. Aaron. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Joe, and, and Mary and Lily for putting this together. Obviously, it's, we've been able to utilize this funding for a little while. It's great, and I think the the new format will be interesting. Um, I think we have I think we have a couple people from Holyoke on this call. Hopefully, our DPW and our police, so the, they can be part of this this grant application uh, to make sure it's one application coming in from the city. My question is under the community planning part in that section. Um, I'm assuming we're going to probably apply for a waiver, perhaps because. You know, as you know, again, I can we can bring this offline if it makes more sense. But you know, we're still trying to capitalize on the tourism aspect of, of MGM Casino here in Springfield, and we've had some really great success uh, with our website and with some of the collaborations going on, our mural tours and stuff like that. Um, event event shuttles coming from MGM to events in Holyoke. I'm hoping we're going to be able to still. It's not normal city practices, so it doesn't fall under stuff that should be covered under the city. The Explore Holyoke website is completely independent. Um, we'd hate to see it, you know not continue. So I'm um, just wondering if under that community planning, can we sort of look for that waiver to kind of continue some of that work that we've been doing? Yeah, you can you can request a waiver from any provision of the guidelines. Um, so, uh, you know, and obviously there's a waiver form and, and you need to submit documentation backing up why it's, you know, why a waiver is appropriate and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, we haven't always granted waivers, but, you know, uh, but waivers are certainly eligible for any particular requirement uh, in the guidelines. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see, we have a question from uh, Springfield Parking Authority. Do we have to be included in the application from the city of Springfield, even though we are independent from the city? We are a quasi state entity. Uh, so we are trying to figure out how we should proceed with an application for the next round. Thus far, we have not received any assistance from the Gaming Commission, even though we have been significantly impacted by the casino and its free parking. Um, so we have, uh, we have done grants with the Parking Authority before. Um, and th those were done through the city. So uh, my suggestion would be um, uh, that, you know, th that the, the, the parking authority, uh, this is a municipal grant program. So, it, you know, anything would have to be done through the municipality. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we um, I know we did one grant to look at uh, the loss of revenues or something from from that, but I believe that was done through the city. But yeah, this this would have to be done um, uh, through the city of Springfield with their application. Okay, um, so that's all the questions. So that was great. Um, a lot of very good questions. Um, so I'm going to go back uh, to sharing my screen and. Um, Let's see. And I'm going to go. There we go. All right, everybody's got that. Um, all right, so on the application process, um, the uh, again, we're, we'll ask you, please, please read the guidelines before filling out your application. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, and uh, also all of your municipalities have received the proposed grant amount letter and that outlines the, what needs to be done to do that. We sent that uh, to the, uh, the, basically the CEO of every community and we copied um, several other people in each community. So um, if for some reason any community has not received their grant amount letter, uh, please let Mary know, and um, we'll we'll make sure that's done. But I think that we've gotten um, uh, replies from everyone on that. So again, application must be submitted by 11:59 p.m. on January 31st. Uh, we do this all via email now. Since we did started last doing that last year, we'll go through uh, that a little bit in a, a little bit later. And again, just the one application per community. And it also needs to be signed by uh, an employee with signatory authority. So that's typically gonna be the, the mayor, the town manager or something like that. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Mary uh, who's gonna start walking us through the application process a little bit. Okay. 
You're on mute, Mary. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so we're going to briefly go through uh, some of the application portion so that people can understand the information that is vital to our program. Um, this first one is the information we need to see in the application. The municipal grant manager will be responsible for collecting the applications and attachments for a submission of the full application to the commission. Uh, the municipal grant manager will receive this information from the project contact for each category. And as we get into the applications, you will see that each application has a has a specific area where you uh, input the information for the contact person. Um, municipalities need to make sure that they update the, if there's any changes to these listings. Um, I know just from my past couple of weeks of contacting communities, uh, there's been a lot of uh, municipal personnel moving around. So we really need accurate information. And if you know someone in your municipality is leaving their position and that they have a part of the community mitigation fund that they manage, it's vital that we get this information. Uh, one point to consider when the uh, when selecting your municipal grant manager is that they're also going to be compiling the information for the quarterly reports, which they'll receive from the project contact people within the municipality. So you want to, you want this person to be someone who's going to be there and can contact easily all the other sub managers of this program. Next. Okay, let's take a look at this budget category summary. If you look at the top line, total FY 2025 allocation is for 400,000. So I'm pointing this out because if you look down at the total, you can see that the total exceeds the allocation amount. So I wanted to point that out. And I also want to point out that both the public safety and the transportation grants, you'll see that number of projects is two. So this means that there's going to be two separate applications under public safety and two under transportation. Uh, let's see. Let's make and sure. Mary, I just let me just add in there. So that, yep. that FY 2025 allocation that's in the upper left, that would be the proposed grant amount that was sent out to your community. So um, if you got 500,000 or 800,000 or whatever the number is, that, that should be included in that upper left hand corner. Yeah. Okay. And if we want to go to the next slide, Joe. Okay. So here it shows that indeed under public safety, there's two discrete applications for different amounts. Um, and you'll also note that uh, again, based on that 400,000 um, under transportation, there's a $1 million grant. This is the this is the application in which a waiver would be needed because that would bring the total of the whole uh, application over the four hundred thousand. Uh, the the details on the specific waivers will be discussed a little bit later in our presentation. Nick and and I would just add on this, Mary, um, on the on the descriptions. Um, We'd like you to give us a nice, you know, uh, brief description of, of the projects and, and, and not just have them be, you know, um, uh, mitigation grant or something like that. Um, we put these into our database and we're able to run reports that show, you know, what types of projects we're doing. And, and you know, we'd like to have a nice, um, you know, tight description of what your project is. Okay, and here, um, we need you to make sure that the application is signed by someone with the authority to commit funds on behalf of the municipality, municipality on the document. Um, and that's about it. Okay, so we're going to turn over to Lily, who's going to walk you through some of the, the, the particular details of the application. 
So again, as we said, one of the big pieces here is that you're going to be submitting one application. Um, you can see here we have some fun different colors for the different uh, categories that we have. So what you can do is if it's easier for you, your municipality is your administrator can send out these forms and then have one person compile them all back together. Um, but you'll see that under each of the categories, we'll have some similar uh, things that are needed. So you can click to the next one. So we're going to be going through two different example applications. Uh, these are a little bit short just because the length of application we're looking for would not fit on a slide. Um, but you can see here we're going to walk through really quickly a community planning uh, example and then we'll walk through a transportation example. So under this you'll see that your projects each individually need a name so that we can identify them uh, and you can identify them because if you're asking for multiple things under a category we want to make sure we're talking about the right project. And then you're going to be able to have two spots to add a project contact. So this is going to be the day to day point of contact on this piece of it. Obviously, we know that your administrator might not know the nitty gritty of what's happening with these individual projects. So this is who we'll be reaching out to if there's questions on that specific project. We gave you a uh, space for two different individuals. And if there are more individuals in your community that need to be CC'd on emails, we just ask that you do that internally. Um, and again, just please try to fill this out as fully as possible so that we know who we're talking with and how to get a hold of them. So then you're going to get into the meat of your application. So the first question that we're asking is about identifying the impact of the gaming establishment. As you know, we've said a couple of times, there has to be an impact for there to be a grant or for there to be a, a chance of a grant. So you'll note in each of the different sections. We even just put the page numbers right there in the guidelines to tie to where in the guidelines you can find examples. So this image on the right is a screenshot of right out of the guidelines. Uh, so you can see that in this application, they looked at the negative impacts under that were eligible under community planning. They saw that competition from a gaming establishment having negative impacts on businesses was an eligible um, activity. Uh, and so they just copied and pasted it. It can be as simple as that for something that we've identified. You know, if you would like to add a couple sentences in here, just, you know, how it particularly impacts your region, uh, that's totally fine. But if you're using something from the guidelines, again, it'll be pretty quick, pretty straightforward for you to make that connection to the casino. If you're not using something directly out of the guidelines, uh, it's going to be a little bit more tricky <laughs> for you. So what you're going to have to do if you're not using something that's in the guidelines is you're going to have to actually go through and provide a pretty detailed explanation of the impact and provide some sort of evidence or relevant research to why you think that that is an eligible expense. So like Joe said, there's lots of resources online. Uh, you know, you can use resources particular to your community, and this will be under every category. So if, for instance, you know, you want to petition that some road that we did not identify is something that should be used, you know, you can provide the traffic studies that your community has done on any of those kind of pieces. So again, if you are submitting this with something in the guidelines, you know, this section can truly be, you know, one to three sentences. If you are not, we expect a pretty sizable explanation of what's happening and information pointing to, you know, uh, you know, uh, what is what is happening there. So that kind of looks like what our community planning uh, application looks like. And I'm going to say our second section, this is going to be really the meat of your application. This can be you know, multiple pages, uh, if that's what it takes to get this section done. Uh, again, like this is short because it needed to fit on a slideshow. So your second section is you're going to describe the project in detail and how that project is actually going to address the impact. So this should be the detailed description of what you are doing. So in this section, you can also, you know, we love we love attachments, but uh, we love any scopes, diagrams, any bids. Um, so you can see below in this one, they are looking for some wayfinding. They felt that, you know, if they could do some increased signage, they could kind of mitigate some of that lost business by letting the casino patrons know that these businesses existed. So you can see below there's a design mock-up of some signage that they're looking to pay for. Uh, and they kind of, they really outline saying that, you know, they want to do a current signage um, study and they're going to do that with their actual internal department of public works versus doing it with a consultant um so again like this piece of it really you want to spend the most time explaining to us what you're trying to do 
And so here I'm just going to jump into uh, what the transportation and transportation construct uh, planning and construction application will look like. As you see, uh, pretty similar. Um, you have a project name. You'll need to put the grant uh contacts in there and you can see in this application they also pulled out directly from the guidelines what they wanted um so they did not have to rationalize what the project was and then you can see that in the second piece uh they're describing the traffic study that they want to do uh they say that they did a preliminary design and their estimated construction cost is three million and then based on the subsidy how much they're going to they're looking to get. So Joe will go into more depth about the new subsidy rules. Um, but then you'll also see below that a proposed MGC grant budget. So each category will have a proposed MGC grant budget. And if you're looking through that, you can see that you're going to have to do a description of the purchase or work. So if you are applying for public safety equipment, you're going to need to itemize each individual thing that you're looking for. You can see in this, they were looking for um, different phasing. Um, and so they identified the different tasks that they were doing, and they also identified the timeline. The timeline is important for us so that when we're going through your quarterly reports, we can look and make sure that the project is running on time, or if it's not, uh, we can look at some different ways to remedy that. Um, and so again, like this will be included on every single category will be expected to put in the grant budget. Uh, and this is a really important piece because when we're going through and reviewing applications, this is how we are going to look through each of your individual budgets and determine line item by line item if you know the commission feels that this is appropriate for a recommendation of funding. Um, and you can see in this, they said that the town has funded multiple stages of the design um, and they're asking for the construction funding on this. So I think just an important thing to note is if you happen to have been working with a consultant already and have a budget, feel free to include that as an attachment, but you must fill out this section. You may not just type C attached. So I think that's about everything on that. Uh, and I will turn it back over to Joe to go into the subsidies. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, so on the transportation construction subsidies, um, we do not fund 100% of uh, construction uh, projects uh, typically. Um, what the commission has determined over the years is that even though some of these construction projects are mitigating a casino related impact, the, the benefits to the community at large are typically uh, greater than, than that of which the, the, uh, you know, the casino related uh, impacts. So uh, what we had done in the past was we were, we were funding essentially one, one third of the project cost up to uh, a, a maximum grant of one and a half million dollars. Now we've kept that one and a half million dollar uh, cap, but in response to a, a number of our communities requesting this, what we've done is essentially uh, created a bit of a sliding scale where smaller projects get a higher percentage of funding than the larger projects. So what we've done is we're saying that up to we will pay 100% of the project cost up to $250,000. And then we'll fund up to 30% of the costs um, above that. So actually, I'm going to click back to the, to the previous uh, uh, slide here. And on the, on the second um, uh, page of that, we talk about, in, in this case, we had a $3 million project. And based on the guidelines, the grant will be 1,075,000. So that's 100% of the first 250,000 and 30% of the remaining uh, 2.75 million. That gives us the, um, the 1.075 million in that case. Now, of course, that would exceed the total grant amount in, in, this, in our fictional case. So a waiver would, would be required. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So what essentially this does is it creates a sliding scale. So for a project, if you had a $250,000 project, we would pay 100% of it. But if it's a $500,000 project, we're paying a lesser percentage. And as the project gets larger and larger, we wind up um, you know, sort of at that maximum value of 1.5 million. We're still roughly at the same amount we were in previous years of about one third of the project costs. Now, with that said, we are, for most communities when they've done transportation construction projects, have typically only come in with one project uh, for the community. Um, but we have had instances where more than one project might come in. 
And what we're saying here is that you can't come in and, and do say, I wanna do three $250,000 projects and have the, the uh, community mitigation fund pay for that entire amount. What we're saying here is that if you're doing more than one construction project, everything is additive here. Only the first $250,000 gets the 100% subsidy. So, um, you know, essentially we just don't, didn't want people to try to kind of game the system on that, but we did want to give some relief for those smaller projects that, that might have a little bit harder time, um, you know, finding, finding money for them. We've had a couple in the past, you know, blue bikes and things like that, where uh, the community wasn't able to come up with their own money. And, um, you know, so it felt like that some of these smaller projects getting that 100% subsidy was, was, was okay. Um, on transportation planning eligibility, um, so for transportation planning projects, um, you know, what we've done through, through the course of this, through the environmental impact reports and so on, the licensees have all done these various maps that show uh, kind of where the percentages of traffic are going from the casino. And for the for planning projects, you know, we're saying that essentially you can do studies and things of that nature on, on any of the major routes to the casino. And what we're saying by uh, major routes is anything that carries at least 1% of the casino related traffic. So in the guidelines, we've included this map that you see here, as well as uh, maps for um, Springfield and for Plain, Plainville, uh, showing where the traffic distribution is going. Now, if the community has some data that shows that other roads are significantly impact, we, impacted, we would certainly consider that, but this has sort of been our baseline and we've, we've used this uh, kind of methodology in our evaluations of, of, of applications. Um, you know, in some cases we've had communities who are looking to, uh, you know, do work on really very, you know, roads that, that weren't really impacted by the casino and we, and we weren't able to approve those. So what we're giving you is these, this sort of roadway network saying that, you know, if you're doing any work on any of these roads that are over 1%, um, we're okay with that. If you're trying to do any other road, you're gonna to have to need to uh, provide some more information that will convince us that, that they are significantly impacted. And then the other thing is also for bike paths, uh, what we're calling multi-use paths. Um, uh, we have funded a lot of those, but we certainly do need the community to demonstrate that, that those bike paths are, uh, or multi-use paths are part of a network that would take people to the casino. Um, if a community is just proposing to build a piece of a bike path that has really you know, sort of no potential of, of people going down to the casino on that route, uh, we aren't going to fund that. Um, and, and we have funded, I know, I think in Cambridge last year, we funded a, a, a design of a bike path that, that didn't have a, a sort of a direct nexus to the casino, but there is a plan for extending other parts of bike paths and so on. So if, you know, if it's something as part of a, uh, a proposed network, um, that would lead to that. You know, we can't guarantee that every piece of a network would be built, but um, but again, we need to have sort of that that nexus saying that 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 this bike path that you're that you're proposing to build is going to have a, a good potential to be used by folks who are who are uh, going to the casino. And then um, waivers. Um, again, we said. You can get a waiver from any requirement of the guidelines. You need to fill out a form to do that. But particularly with this new block grant approach is we're saying that if any municipality determines that the proposed grant allotment is insufficient to mitigate the identified impacts, it may request a waiver for those specific projects. Um, and it, it, here we're saying that we, we don't expect this waiver to be used just for sort of routine expenses. You know, if you've, if you've got a, a grant of uh, $400,000 and you put $100,000 into each category and, and, and uh, some of, one of the, the, the group says, well, I, I really need $103,000. You know, our suggestion there is may, maybe you ought to fine tune your, your, your scope a little bit. Uh, but these are really more for a project that really couldn't be done unless you got a waiver. 
Um, so we, we, we expect that these would typically be the larger transportation construction projects and things of that nature, rather than sort of the more routine expenses that, that, that a community might, um, might expect to have. Okay, and I'm gonna go on and Mary's gonna run through this last slide. Again, this is sort of reiterating um, uh, some of the things that we've said before. You're muted, Mary. I always do that. I apologize to everyone. <laughs> um, okay, so as we know, the applications must be submitted by combis or through the MGC CMF by January 31st at 11.59. As Joan noted, that is a statutory deadline, so we have no flexibility with that. Um, the applications must be submitted as one Word document, so your uh, municipal grant manager will be in charge of assembling all the different portions of your application and submit it as one document. And please call us, contact us. If you have any questions prior to submission, we are happy to work with you on this project. And especially we have a number of communities that it's still fairly new. So please do contact us. And, and just to add to that, I think, um, you know, we really want applications to come in by email. Um, we are required as an agency to go out through combis. You do not need to use combis um, at all. Um, we, after the fact, are required to put this stuff up into combis, which is what we did in this last year. I know that combis causes problems for a lot of folks. So please just use the, the MGC CMF uh, at massgaming.gov. Um, email box and that is where we want everything to come in. Yeah, we, we have found that um, using this mailbox is very helpful. And then what uh, once we receive your application, it is downloaded into Combis after the fact, after we receive yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, and then, um, so Lily is gonna walk us through um, the, the community mitigate, uh, the, uh, uh, the MGC website, um, so you just, just so you can see where to uh, find um, some of the uh, some of the information that you might need to see. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay, so this is our website. Uh, just a quick something that throws everyone off is that it is massgaming.com, not massgaming.gov. Um, so just make sure that you're making note of that. So this is what we'll, you'll see when you get to our main page. If you just go to about, you can find the community mitigation fund um, or in the guidelines, we've made it a clickable link. So we have done a lot of changes to our community mitigation fund uh, website. So there are a lot of great resources that you can access here to help with your application. Um, when you click community mitigation fund, you will have an at a glance of where the combines is. And down here where it has the um, municipal trainings, we will be posting the trainings as well as the slideshow. Um, but again, our contact information is on the website and uh, the basic information for how to apply. If you go into this sidebar over here and you click application guidelines, it will bring you to the application guidelines. So this up on top, you can click it and you'll open up our guidelines. Uh, we also have some resources below. Uh, so the first one is if you're interested in how we got to our funding formulas and you were not part of that process, there is a memo on how those numbers were decided, as well as a copy of the final allocation by municipality. So if you just didn't happen to be on the email list, your application allocation is also right here. So one of the big things we are trying to stress this year is that there is so much wonderful research out there that will make your lives a lot easier uh, in when you're trying to apply. So you'll see here some resources. This will link you to the research agenda. Uh, then we also have specifically the community engaged research that's been done. So this might bring some inspiration to projects uh, that are happening all over the state that might be relevant to your community. 
Uh, as Joe mentioned, we did work with some consultants this year, and we have some pretty extensive uh, slide decks where you can learn more about impacts that may be caused by the casino that could be relevant to your application. So we did those in three different categories. So one is economic impact, one is public safety impact, and then one is priority populations. Um, so these are groups that can be disproportionately impacted by the presence of a casino. So if you are uh, applying and any of those are relevant to your category, I highly recommend you look through those. And then for everyone that is looking for a transportation related grant, we did um, pull these out of the really very long documents that came out uh, when the casinos were originally um, coming through. So there are trip distribution maps for each of the three gaming establishments in the state. Um, and you'll see that both um, Encore and MGM have a distribution table as well. So uh, you can use those to look at the different maps that were done uh, to help bolster your application or to understand more if your roads are in the 1% category that Joe was talking about earlier. Um, again, on our sidebar, if you go over here, you can find the FY25 forms relevant to the application. So you'll see up on top, we have the municipal FY 2025 application form. So this is your main form that you will be filling out. And as we had mentioned, we did make an example application if you kind of wanted to see what you know a community could look like for their application. Um, and again, like this application is around 25 pages. So this is not you know, necessarily a quick application uh, once you fill it out, but you know, we wanna make sure that we have all the details that we need to review your application. Uh, and again, as Mary said, if you have any questions, this can be a very collaborative process um, before your applications are due. So we're happy to sit down and meet with different towns and understand a little bit more about what they're trying to accomplish. Um, here is the waiver form for the municipalities. Uh, and this will need to be submitted with your application form uh, if you are requesting a waiver at the time of your application. Down here is if you are a regional agency, uh, here is your relevant application form and waiver. And then for everyone who is uh, currently has a grant, just let you know that our calendar year 2023 to 2015 grant, your forms are still also located here. Uh, and then the last piece here is we do have an archive of every single grant that we have um, received uh, and a grant uh, that has been awarded previously could provide some inspiration. I will say that just because it was previously awarded does not mean that it is something that, you know, we will, you know, out of pocket say yes to, but there are some really great projects for some inspiration. If your community has some funds and you're not quite sure what to spend them on, uh, this can be a great uh, area right here to look back. Um, so you just click the number and then we'll have all of the different applications and what they were awarded by category. So. That's kind of a quick run through our website. Okay, um, thanks Lily. Um, and I think, so with that, I think we will stop here for uh, questions. And let me see uh, where, we, where we left off, uh, whoops. Um, We... Uh, okay, so the, next, the first question here was, can the grant be a PDF document since graphics are sometimes hard to include in a Word document? Um, you know, if, I guess if you, can, if you can get your whole thing down to a single PDF document, I, I think we would certainly take that. Um, what we found last year was we asked for PDFs and we, we would wind up getting, you know, 12 documents submitted that we would have to pull together into a single uh, PDF. Um, the thought here was if it was a great, if it was a Word document, um, we could do that, but we, we can certainly. Um... So just to jump in there. Um, so if you know how to please submit it as an editable PDF. Um, when we get all of our applications, we need to intake them all. And so it does take us a lot longer if we need to manually rewrite your application. So you're welcome to send us a PDF and also a Word document or an editable PDF. I just know some folks, uh, after they get them signed, will just scan them in. Uh, so that sometimes, you know, will add a lot of extra steps on our end. So if possible, you can Google how to make an editable PDF. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. 
just a, a plea for myself there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have to do a lot of data entry. Yes, there, there was a lot of retyping that happened last year that was uh, un unexpected. Felt like I was in secretarial school, actually. Um, until what date are we able to email you with specific project questions? Um, I would say right up until the deadline. Um, well, I won't be here till 1159 on January 31st. So, uh, you know, any, any time between now and then, we, we'd be happy to, to talk with you, meet with you. If you've got a specific project that you're, you're, you're not really sure that it sounds like it fits, we, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you about those things. Um, a couple of things um, that just came to mind are, you know, if your community, for whatever reason, cannot identify enough projects for the full amount of the grant that we proposed, you can submit for a lesser amount. You know, you don't have to come in for the full amount if you can't identify projects, um, but we certainly don't want you to lose out on all of the money by thinking that you have to come in for, for, the, for the full amount. Obviously, we'd love to see you come in for the full amount. Um, but, um, you know, and also once applications are received, as I said earlier, I think especially this first year of this 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 revamp, we, you know, we'll work with each community to try to, uh, you know, if we see there are some issues with the application, we'll try to work with you to to make some modifications or do what we need to do to try to get all of these things to fit. We understand that, um, you know, we're making some wholesale changes to this program, and we want to work with you to the extent that we can. Um, so, with that. Um, Let's see. Um, okay, are there any other questions? You folks can either put your hand up uh, or uh, uh, Okay, well, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, again, feel free to reach out. Um, so some of you may have accepted both this meeting and the meeting on Thursday. The meeting on Thursday will be identical to this meeting, so you don't feel the need to feel the need to attend both of them unless you have some other uh, questions um, and and so on. Um, but so yeah, th this is um, we will be doing the same exact meeting for uh, for Thursday. Oh, another question did just pop up. Um, any movement on Everett Casino doing a patron survey to see how people arrive there with routes and modes. Uh, a patron survey actually was just completed um, and uh, was presented to the commission, um, I think last week. Um, so that should be up on our website in our research area. Um, Mary or Lily, maybe you can um, just... Uh, uh, yeah, it's up on the research area. Okay, maybe yes. maybe you can find the link to that and send that to Bill. Um, okay, um, if there's nothing else, let me just, uh, so there's me and Mary and Lily, uh, we're around. Um, you know, I'm sure this will be taking a little bit of time off around the holidays, but we will do whatever we can to uh, help you guys through this process and and, and it's our fervent hope that this uh, will make the process a little bit easier for communities, give communities a bit more um, certainty and how much money they, they're, they're gonna get. Um, and, um, you know, and hopefully make this process uh, smoother for everybody involved. Um, and thanks again for coming. Um, do appreciate all of your time and uh, look forward to working uh, with all of you uh, over the next uh, several months. Mary, Lily, anything else? All right, well, I, I guess with that, we will we will close out for today and again, look forward to, um, to, to working with all of you. Thanks. Great, thank you very much.